Luke chapter 1, verses 8 to 25. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of, righteous, of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and, well, my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but he remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favour and has taken away my disgrace among the people. Good evening, everyone. Great to be here with you. We are in Luke chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel, and uh, we have Zechariah the priest confronted in the midst of his labours by an angel. Right, okay. So we're thinking this evening about waiting for God to show up. Waiting for God to show up. Let's pray and consider that common experience. Father, thank you so much for your word, uh, for it records your action uh, within humanity uh, to save the world. In particular, the promise and then the gift of your son, his ministry, um, death, resurrection, ascension. And we are those who wait for his coming again. Um, so, Lord, as Zechariah and his people waited, uh, we also wait. Thank you that you uh, fulfilled your promise in his lifetime, spoke words of fulfilment in his hearing. Uh, may it be also with us, Lord, that we would have such uh, a vision uh, of your coming that it would shape our days and order our lives for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, Nobody likes to feel stuck. It's a dreadful feeling to feel trapped or caught or locked into a situation that is harmful or hurtful or empty or meaningless. If you're like me, those are the times you begin to wonder what God is up to and perhaps maybe if he's there at all. And uh, I'd love to be, you know, a fly on the wall uh, and uh, be party to those conversations you've had with God when you get in that situation, when you feel like you are completely stuck. 
Of course, you don't have to be a believer to to think like this. And quite a number of people have had bad things happen to them or watch the terrible, terrible things that go on in the world and say, nope, I can't believe in a God who allows that. And if that's a conversation you've had with someone you love, please talk to a staff member about it or your gospel community leader about it. It's so common. And a moment's thought will teach us that just a couple of further questions will break that cause and effect link for people. That is, if they really want to find an answer. Those of us who've walked with Jesus a while will know that he doesn't often answer our prayers the way we want him to. The problem is we're focused on our thing. So, you know, here's my thing, and it's not working very well at the moment, so I'm telling God about that, and I'm, I'm kind of waiting for him to fix that for me. That's a reasonably familiar prayer request. I think you've probably prayed that way even today. But the thing with God is his picture is bigger than ours. So while we're kind of fretting about, you know, the, the thing that's not working over here, he's probably at work over there, except we're so focused on our thing we can't see it. And you walk with Jesus a while, and and as you do, you get a kind of wider perspective on on your past, you know, the last week or the last month or the last year. And you begin to see how God has been at work, you know, in in ways other than than the particular thing that you were focused on in the time. In fact, he was answering your prayer. He was just doing it this way uh, rather than that way. (laughs) Happens all the time. It's also true that sometimes it's not the situation that has to change, but us. All this is just to say it's no wonder we find it difficult to understand what God is doing when we think from our point of view about our lives and our world and what we think needs being done. See, the problem there is, of course, that God has his point of view. I suppose we must allow him that. And that's the thing he's actually on about. So while we're kind of, you know, focused on whatever it is is annoying us at the moment, we can be blinded to the, the big thing that God is doing, to the way that he is still hearing those prayers and faithfully working to answer them. Yes, the scriptures make it quite clear that God is working his plans and purposes out and that what's really going on is that we're being invited to partner or participate with him in what he's doing, not not here to invite him into what we're doing. That's the reason I think so many people get confused and why they think God doesn't answer their prayers. Now, that being the case, of course, being a believer can only make this situation worse. Because believers take to heart God's word, and of course, that word contains various promises. So, what if the promises don't seem to be happening? Okay, that's like double jeopardy, isn't it? God's made a promise, I've believed it, kind of, where is it? What then? Well, in a sense, that describes all of us. We should all be praying every day, your will be done, your kingdom come. But, well, we've been waiting 2,000 years, and we're still waiting, and all the while we're caught up in in the inevitable decay of our broken world. So so what is a person who prays the Lord's Prayer every day supposed to think? And I start that way because Zechariah has been waiting. God's people had endured slavery, exodus, running battles with their neighbours and then exile, and now they're under Roman rule. They live in an occupied land and they're waiting for God to show up something he's promised to do on various occasions. If you know your Old Testament reasonably well, you'll know that in Deuteronomy 18, 18, God promises the people a prophet like Moses. One like Moses. In 2 Samuel 7, if you know the story of King David, you'll remember that God promises Israel a king to sit on David's throne forever. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You know, here's, here's God speaking of, of another, one who would come. Daniel 7, one like a son of man, quoted in your New Testament many times. 
But, you know, surely the second last verse in the Old Testament, if you've got your Bible there, you know, flip between the Old and the New, <laughs> is a bit of a clue. Malachi 4 and verse 5, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. End of the Old Testament. Surely those words would have been ringing in the ears of every Israelite. So much so that every time, even today, when they celebrate the Passover, there's an empty chair. Did you know that? Guess who the empty chair's for? Elijah. That the Messiah would come. Still waiting. It's bad enough to live with the disappointment of God not behaving as you imagine he would, but much harder when he does not behave as he said he would. But we're not the only ones waiting. God is waiting too. Waiting for the right time, his time. The time to fulfil his many wonderful promises. As a kid, I can remember Christmas taking forever. I can remember the Christmas holidays being like a lifetime. It was hot, I lived by the beach, and it was just endless. They were endless. Every day seemed to go on forever. You know, the sun's up for 68 hours a day, and, and then my, Christmas is kind of at the end of it, and it was never going to come. I can remember shaking with excitement at the prospect of Christmas, right? But it took so long to come. <laughs> Zechariah's people, God's people, had their land. It's part of the promise, but no king. Someone else ruled them, someone called Herod, who wasn't really a Jew at all. Zechariah was a priest, but he'd never had the opportunity to stand before God in the temple and represent his people. I know that because you only got that opportunity once. And that's what this story is about. He was chosen by Lot. He is an old man. He's way too old to have kids. He's been a priest his whole life. Twice a year, his um, group, one of 24 groups, a name I can't pronounce, um, of priests, were called up for their duty at the temple for his whole life. He'd gone to Jerusalem twice a year and never been chosen. He and Elizabeth were both upright and blameless, but had no children. Waiting for God to fulfill his promise to his people and give them a king. Waiting just to be chosen to do his job and waiting for a child. That's a lot of waiting. But then, but then God's time comes around. Verse 9, he is chosen. He was chosen by Lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense, the incense representing the prayers of the people. They do have a child, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to give him the name John. John who? John the Baptist. Correct. And of course... After this, his wife Elizabeth becomes pregnant and for five months remains in seclusion. He is chosen. They do have a child and they do get their king. Verse 17. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You should recognize that, the last verses of the Old Testament. And this king is coming. He's coming very soon. He's coming in John's lifetime. Sorry. Yep, John's lifetime. I expect Zechariah saw him. I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to find that out. No, you have to find that out. And you tell me. (laughs) Give you some work to do. (laughs) Like Zechariah and the others, we also wait We've just had a huge reminder of what it's like to wait 18 months in lockdown. (laughs) But really, every time the transitoriness and uncertainty of this life bites, we're reminded of Jesus' promise to come again, 
and take us to our forever home with him. Oh yes, we know what it means to wait. And so what do you do when the God you are waiting for appears? Now we're good Anglicans and when we run our services, thanks Jeff, um, you know, there's a liturgy and we all kind of know what the responses are and so on. But how about, how about one day, you know, you uh, kneel down to do your prayers and you say, dear Lord, and a voice says, yes. <laughs> That's not what I'm expecting. <laughs> well, what do you do when the God you're waiting for appears? Well, Zechariah might be able to give us a few tips about what not to do, do you think? Did you listen carefully? Because we see in Zechariah that unbelief leads to silence in the face of good news. Unbelief leads to silence in the face of good news. Like us, Zechariah is just going about his business, except it's God's business, for he was a priest. And he's in the temple, and he's offering up the prayers of the people for one time in his life, when God interrupts him. Suddenly, worship is not a ritual, not an obligation, not a habit. God speaks back and answers the cry of his people. <laughs> Are you ready for that when you pray? Remember, it is the Lord of heaven and earth we worship. You're not here to listen to me. <laughs> You're here to meet with him. Coming before him should be anything but routine. Anyway, Zechariah objects. Good idea. Next time God talks to you, object. See what happens. <laughs> Mm -mm. how can I be sure of this how can I be sure of this he's waited so long he and Elizabeth are past childbearing age but this guy's a priest doesn't he remember the story of his own people can you think of some Israelites who were too old to have children who had children anyway Well, there you are. If you can think of it, he should have been able to think of it. Abraham and Sarah, right at the very beginning of Israel's story. This is the way it rolls. And of course, not just them, but many other couples as well. He says, I am old. The angel says, I am Gabriel. You know, it's a bit of an unfair contest, really, isn't it? You know, here's my objection. I am old, right? Well, here's the answer. I am Gabriel. Well, okay, I think I'm outclassed. <laughs> Zechariah wants proof. He wants a sign, okay? He will be dumb, that is, unable to speak, and probably deaf, according to the way I read it, because he's unable to communicate. They have to write. He's been given good news, but he will be unable to communicate it. That's his sign. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. That's a sign to Zechariah that God is about to fulfill his promise. He'll be dumb. The birth of the child is a sign to the nation that God is about to fulfill his promise to them. The child himself is a sign. The child himself is the, the vehicle by which God will announce the coming of the king they've been waiting for, the coming of the Messiah. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. The child is the sign. He is John the Baptist. He is Jesus' cousin. He is sent to prepare the way before the Lord. And they don't have long to wait. <laughs> Elizabeth gets pregnant pretty promptly. And if you've got your Bible open, you might notice something you hadn't seen before that relates to Jesus. 
because when she discovers she's pregnant, she remains in seclusion for five months. The Lord has done this for me, she says. In these days, he has ta- shown his favour and taken away my disgrace among the people. The next verse, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel visits Mary. And guess what else is said in train? So praise him, because in Jesus we are the inheritors of this promise too. And remember, God's timing is perfect. He is not limited by our personal or nation's political or military circumstances. You know, we might think it doesn't look like a really good time for God to fulfill his promises. Friends, it's always a good time for God to fulfill his promise. He's still working with his people. He's not forgotten the Jews and he will not forget us. His ways are always miraculous. I mean, think about it. The nation was occupied. The prophets were silent. This is the end of the intertestamental period. It's 400 years of silence. The woman was barren. None of that is any problem for God, and your circumstances are no more difficult. So whether it's the cry of your heart, the agony of the world or our nation, or the apparent failure to show of one of God's promises... He has not forgotten or failed to notice. He will not let you down. He is always faithful, ready to do more than we could ask or imagine. No. We speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen nor ear heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. Friends, as those who wait for God to fulfill his promises or to answer their prayers, we have every reason to be hopeful. He never forgets and he always fulfills his promises.